Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're discussing the latest in health equity news with Dr. Aletha Maybank, AMA's Chief Health Equity Officer in New York. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Maybank, John Lewis was making headlines long before he passed away on July 17th. Uh, can you take a moment to put his death in context for us and tell us about the op-ed piece he wrote shortly before he died? Yes, well, thanks, Todd. Yeah, you know, it's been, you know, quite a week and we've had some amazing opportunities uh, to celebrate his life that have been very public. But John, you know, Lewis, for me as a physician and as a, an advocate and a justice uh, person has um, really like, he rose to the task of what it means to fight justice using his own life many times, but also just having this perseverance and this commitment. And in the space of health justice and advocacy and policy, I mean, he was at the forefront of many key opportunities in this country. I remember a lot of work around gun violence and the work that he did there. But his call, you know, it is phenomenal that he wrote this piece um, prior to his passing and, and then it, it's published for us all to kind of get that message and be inspired. But his marching orders were to really answer the calling of your heart and stand up for what you believe. And that is truly what the work of health equity and health justice is about, is to not be silent and to speak up. And so hopefully many of us and, and are, are absorbing that message and moving it forward, especially at a time now. In your, in your role as a chief health equity officer and you you read those words, what's it, what's it actually mean to you? And, how do you uh, how do you take that into the future? Yes, well, for me, what's really helpful about it is that it contextualizes my work. I am standing on the shoulders of so many others before me that have opened doors so that I could be here to do what I am doing today. Others who had to fight in ways that I don't have to fight to be on the front lines, literally, and crossing a bridge where you're encountering. Um, police officers. Now, now that is happening today in many cities across the country, but to be attacked by dogs, that's a whole nother level of fighting for justice. And I feel if folks did that and for my right to vote, as John Lewis did, then I have an obligation, one, to vote. I think we all do for the fight that that was, but then an obligation to continue this work forward. So it helps me recommit um, and stay committed and, and it allows me to know that this is the right path. This is the right path for myself, and this is the right path for the country. Well, let's uh, turn our attention to a couple of key pieces of research that have come out recently from JAMA uh, that are about data, which is something that you've been speaking about for many months. Uh, the question is, are we underestimating the impact of COVID-19 on Black and Latinx populations? Uh, can you talk about the first study? Thanks, Todd, for the question. And just really great to see JAMA kind of publishing articles as it relates to, to racism um, in this way and data. Uh, and this article is really um, comparing weighted and unweighted population data to assess the inequities as it relates to COVID-19 by race and ethnicity, as it was reported by the, the Center for D Disease Control, the CDC. Um, and it was a group of researchers who were out of um, the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. And their critical finding really is that the CDC's weighted data distributions to examine COVID-19 by race and ethnicity do underestimate the excess burden of COVID-19 among Black and Latinx individuals. So that's really concerning um, because data is really important in how we distribute funds uh, in this country, data is a, is a tool for change. Uh, and so we need to ensure that the data is accurately reflecting what is happening. And so this means that the methodologies, the ways in which people look at and analyze the data are very important. And so in this particular situation, because they controlled for geographic distribution of basically where people live, so the rate by race and ethnicity, you also ended up controlling for segregation which is a major driver for unequal health outcomes within this country. And so it really shows to us that it's critical that the methods that we use have an anti-racism lens. And this is important for researchers and editors and publishers to build that skill set. Well, let's turn uh, our attention to a second study. Um, there have been questions about the role that poverty plays in COVID-19 infections and related deaths. Can you talk about the latest news uh, in that area? Yes, thanks, Todd. So this is a, a piece that was published in JAMA again um, from some lead doctors that were at uh, NYU. And they looked at data from counties 
um, surrounding and, and inside of Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, LA, Miami, a whole bunch of cities across the country. Um, and they looked at COVID-19 infections as well as deaths per 100,000 people. And so they tested the associations um, with percent below poverty, the county level income, and the percent that were living in the, in the county of racial and ethnic minority groups. And so the conclusion that they came up with as the article states, and I'll, I'll say exactly what the article states, is that while the excess burden of both infections and deaths are experienced by poorer and more diverse areas, racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 infections and deaths exist beyond those explained by differences in income. And this is really important. This is a critical point because oftentimes folks in this work and, and, and what we hear um, is that, well, isn't it only, this is really about, you know, socioeconomic status and income. It's not really about race. And this type of analysis shows us that it is about race. And we see this play out with other, other um, opportunities as well as, for example, maternal death, you know, in places like New York City and really across the country, you know, the reality is if you are a black woman, your likelihood of dying during childbirth is still higher than that of a, of a white woman who doesn't even have a college degree. And so there's something that shows that there's something particular about race and racism of why these things exist and happen. I, also important is that the article points out as what we mentioned before about the ability to have data is that there's just not enough data to really fully assess the impact of structural racism and the drivers on this particular data set. Well, we continue to learn more about that. Uh, we're also seeing uh, inequities in terms of access to care, uh, specifically around COVID-19 testing. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Yes, yeah, so there was a, a really comprehensive analysis that was published by 538 and the ABC News of affiliates um, uh, earlier this week, um, saying it says, you know, one a COVID test, it's much easier to get one in a wealthier white neighborhood. You know, and, and the article points out, and we all know we're almost at the 4 million mark, right? Or we are at the 4 million mark, you know, with cases across the country um, and the demand for tests are growing. Um, and this is really, you know, how it should be really from a public health management perspective, but our ability to respond is really hard. And so their analysis is, is a really comprehensive analysis looking across all 50 states using data um, that's provided by Google Maps, a pretty comprehensive data set as well. Um, and they were able to assess kind of where testing sites are based on city, um, based on the city and the county and the state, and then also able to pull data from uh, city and state mm -hmm. health departments as well. And the reality really in, in bottom mm -hmm. line is that accessing a test, accessing a test is really difficult, um, especially in communities that have black and Latinx people. The demand is higher, the wait time is higher, uh, it, it's just harder to get a test. And this is really reflective of all the longstanding inequities and equalities that are deeply rooted in all of our systems. And the realities, again, of our segregated residential living situations and our segregated healthcare um, in this country. Yeah, so those kind of delays in uh, testing create a terrible cycle because when you don't know what the results are or you uh, disable the kind of uh, contact tracing and any of the kind of elements that we need to uh, bring that under control, that, that, that's just not present. It, absolutely. And, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services, they did release a comprehensive strategy to address testing recently, you know, and really targeting um, federally qualified health centers, which definitely are, there are lots that are located in lower income and, and communities that have black and brown people, but also focusing on supporting private public partnerships with folks like CVS and Walgreens, who also have a lots of location um, and space, actually literal space within many of these communities. And, and what's happened is that some docs across the country um, have taken, you know, this testing issue into their ho own hands. And they highlight a story of Dr. Alice Stanford, uh, who is a pediatric surgeon and um, well-respected. And, you know, she and another group of doctors, you know, uh, called Black Doctors COVID Consortium, took a van and, you know, drove around Philadelphia, you know, and able to accomplish testing that way and, and delivered and issued more than 7,000 tests. And definitely hands off, hats off to 
to her and the team for doing that. But the reality is, is that that's not going to meet right the need of what is what is there across the entire country. So we still have a lot of work to do on that front. Well, Dr. Maybeck, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your perspective and your overview of the latest news and research. And thank you to the team at the Center for Health Equity. You are an inspiration too. So that's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back on Monday with another update. Uh, for health equity information and resources on COVID-19, go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thank you for joining us and stay safe.